welcome to The Roundtable, the new series that takes a 360 degree view of the major themes and trends that are occurring across the Australian commercial real estate market at the moment. In this special BTR edition, we have alongside us Chris Key, Managing Director of Australia for Greystar, and of course, Julian Anderson, Director of architectural firm Bates Smart. Moderating the discussion today is Josh. Josh, nice to see you. How are you going? Rob. Yeah, good. How are you? Very well, thank you. I thought we'd open up our discussion, Chris, with Greystar's entrance into Australia. What what made the local market attractive to the business? Yeah, I mean, we've been in, obviously, the US for a very long time. The business started back in 1997. The international expansion started in 2012, post-crisis, and um, we moved into moved into Europe, we moved into to Latin America. And I think what really became you know, obvious to the business was that the the thematic around um, housing, housing shortages, rental accommodation, the mindset of a younger generation towards ownership, there was a series of themes which repeated across geographies. So it didn't matter whether you were in Australia, the UK, continental Europe, parts of Latin America, and we have now have businesses in Brazil and in Chile and other parts of Latin America. There was this underlying trend which was going to expand well beyond the limited amount of countries which it was already present. Did the dream of owning your own home in Australia affect the view on whether to enter this market? No. Nope. Not, Not at all. Level. No, um, I think you know, and and there's been um, you know along this journey, and I've been on the journey for sort of four and a half years or so. Um, you know, I've had plenty of people along the way tell me uh, Australians are different. No, it won't happen. Um, in in all sorts of forums, um, be that private, public forums, um, you know, wherever that might be, um, and. You know, I had very early on advice from our CEO and founder who said to me, look, Chris, you're going to experience people who will tell you that you can't do it. It's different here and, you know, it won't work. He said, I've had that same experience in every place we've been to. And I, I, I agreed with him. So the focus then of a grey star is inner city living and your site selection process in, in assessing sites. When I picture a site in a city, yep. As a brief snapshot, what are, what are you looking for to cater to that demographic that you just spoke yep, about? Yep. Um, so yeah, so I, I'd say we've got more of an, an urban focus in, in, in Australia. We're a very urban population as a country by comparison to a lot of other um, a lot of other nations. If you look at our US business, we're you know we're right across the map. You know, we are in so many different states with all types of different products. But there's a number of different reasons why that model doesn't necessarily apply in Australia. Mm -hmm. The things we look for, I guess, you know, in those urban locations, it's what does the age demographic look like and do they sort of slot into, you know, the right um, characteristics that typically would rent homes from us. Um, so we scrub through that data. We look at obviously transport links. We look at the local offering in terms of lifestyle amenity. And they're probably the main the main things that we they, that we look for. Julian, I just want to bring yourself in here. <clears throat> in terms of the build to rent sector, I'd be interested to get a, your perspective on when clients started yeah. to approach you looking for schemes that could fulfill the build to rent style product. Yeah, sure. We um, look at, I, I think it really started on the back of the slowdown in the large scale build to sell environment, particularly in Melbourne, which happened at the end of 2018, we were working on a number of very large tower build to sell projects in central Melbourne that actually, I guess, in a sense, really fell foul of the, the changes that APRA in, introduced at that time. And, um, you know, deliberately there was then a slowdown in, in, in that market. And we were approached by uh, Grocon now, the home business, and they said, look, we're really keen to get into this market, Daniel's been, Daniel Grollo's been living in New York for a long time. He understands the, the build to rent environment. He understands the, the, the build to rent market very well. And the project that we're, we're doing with, with home at the moment will be complete in the next couple of months. It's on City Road in South Bank. In South Bank. Yeah. It's 400 apartments. So that process really kicked off on a study tour we did with, with Grocon back at the beginning of 2019. We went to 35 properties in in the, in the US, lots of grey star properties um, and learnt, learnt a huge amount. And so we were very like, we were very fortunate to get engaged by them and that led to a design process on that project and then that translated, has now translated into multiple other 
build to rent projects and we've really developed a brief on each of those pro projects on the back of what we learnt on the study tour and then on the back of what we've learnt as we go through the through the pro process and, and refining it for um, you know for our local clients and and, and, and the people that are going to be it, using is it that. dramatically different I like you, you do residential projects every day of the week. Is a build to rent project a dramatic change in the way you go about designing a building? Oh, look, it's a bit different. I mean, I, it was interesting to see places like New York, Manhattan, some of the provision around amenities off, off the charts. And yeah. I was actually looking at some numbers today and I saw that what one of the, the Eugen project, Brookfield, for example, which I think it's 800 apartments, got, there's an arms race in terms of amenity in, in, in those central cities, which I'm sure... Similar to office, you're, really, in a way. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. We were very conscious not to try and you know, pursue that here because that competition does, doesn't does exist. In terms of the comparison between build to rent and build to sell, there's, there's a few key differences. For example, our tower build to rent projects, we're consistently putting amenity at the top of the building hmm. in order to provide a kind of democratisation of space so that every resident is getting access to the best space in the building. Yeah. And that seems to be a pretty consistent theme. And it's, it's good. It, it's because the owner of the building isn't trying to sell the apartments at the top at sort of penthouse prices. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. the, the greater benefit actually is taking people through the development of prospective residents saying, yeah. this is, you know, this is yours. You've got all of this amenity at the top of the building. Um, so there's a bit of an amenity difference which we've seen. And, and then- is that, is that measured as, out of interest? Like, do you look at it as a ratio per yeah, def space? Yeah, de def definitely. I mean, we, we've settled across all of our projects now. There's a pretty consistent figure with which, um, you know, the build to rent operators coming to us, about three and a half square metres per apartment of internal amenity. Mm -hmm. And so that, that actually is pretty consistent. Yeah. It hasn't deviated yet, but I think that's probably because the Australian market is in its Inf infancy a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Our first topic of discussion is the fundamentals that make build to rent stack up, that, that make it uh, attractive to investors like yourself. Chris, I'd be interested to get an understanding on what you look at prior to acquiring a site, but even prior to that, what made investing in Australia an attractive proposition to Greystar? I mean, in terms of investing into Australia, um, you know, we obviously have a platform that reaches right around the world um, and a lot of corners of the world. And when we looked at all of the international markets that we were already in um, and then started to do some work on Australia specifically, the fundamentals in Australia stacked up as well as anywhere else in the world, frankly. And we could see that there was a, you know, there was a real opportunity to bring you know, a new, new and differentiated product to market. That there were some shortcomings in in the existing offering, which was here in Australia. There was also, I guess, a turn in the cycle as well in terms of the, the build to sell cycle. That kind of opened up some opportunity for us as well. But I think really, at a fundamental level, underpinning the decision to come into Australia were sort of the fundamental real estate drivers and the demographics of our of our population, how you know, the younger generation are thinking about their, their housing choices. And in a nutshell, it sounds like you're looking at inner urban accommodation to, to suit the demographic you're talking about. Yeah. I pitch you sites all the time to look at. Mm -hmm. Is, are there certain attributes and criteria that just have to be ticked to satisfy the grey star model? Yeah. Look, I think it, there's a few things, and we've obviously talked about this before. You know, scale is absolutely critical. Um, in terms of the way we try to create community, we need to be able to provision the right level of service into, into our properties. And that's something which is absolutely at the core of what you know, build to rent is as a, as a housing choice that is differentiated from the traditional way of, of doing things. So we need a certain level of scale, you know, obviously transport like any, you know, like a lot of asset classes or a lot of, you know, housing choices, access to transport is, is you know, very, very important. And then we just look, you know, much more closely at the local neighbourhood, um, get more micro, understand what are the choices for people around lifestyle in that local local market mm. and, you know, how much enjoyment can they get from what's outside their door and, and make sure we're making the right choices around. Well, there were some government changes that made it difficult for investors to buy apartments from those Correct. built to sell developments. Yeah. So yeah. it left that sector somewhat exposed. Yes. So there had to be a repurpose, whether it was going to be another residential use or student accommodation, yeah. which we saw a lot of. Yeah. And then obviously build to rent. And, and has that changed 
the way that you design buildings dramatically or are there a lot of similarities oh, in the way there you go are, about it? Josh, there are a lot of similarities. Um, I think the two biggest differences that I can think of are the way amenities delivered within the building. So for example, in a, in a traditional sort of podium tower format, the amenity in a build to rent building is pretty typically always at the top of the building. Mm. So amenities different. The other, the other thing I would say as part of that amenity, and, and we were looking at this pre-pandemic, was the de delivery of more work lounge, business lounge type space within the building. And that was on the back of what we'd seen in the US, you know, desire for people to work from home more. And also we saw that was a function of the sort of rental prices that existed in Manhattan. So a lot of people, rather than getting a two bedroom apartment and using the second bedroom as a work from home environment, they couldn't actually afford the rent. So they get a one bedroom apartment and work from within the building. So we, we're delivering a lot of that in a build to rent apartments and that's actually gonna come back in and influence what comes into the build to sell environment. And then look, the, the creation of communities, the other big difference as well. Mm. And it sits somewhere between what you would typically see in a hotel environment and a, and a build to sell environment, but it is it is quite different mm. in the build to rent it's about environment. Community retention of, of tenants for the long term. Yeah, yeah. There's we we you know they've 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 got the data that says if you know you know two or three people in a in a building, you're more likely to stay, which mm. is exactly what the um, what the the owners and operators want to happen. Mm. So there's a there's a kind of you need to create the physical space to to support that. And that's allowing for spaces in the building where people, large groups of people can come together for pizza nights, wine and cheese, dog petting nights. Um, you know, the the animal overlay is, is really important and big in the US. Um, so they look at, you know, the dog walking tracks, all of that. So it's, it's um, I look, I think it's fantastic. I, I think it's brilliant because yeah. the, the actual management and the concierge and the people working there are very focused on making people feel like they're part of a, a community. Mm. And speaking of building, you're coming out of the ground with two projects yep. in Melbourne at the moment. Yep. I think Offset, you said we, you have been going for about four and a half years now mm -hmm. looking for appropriate sites, one in South Yarra now, one in South Melbourne. Okay. Um, how, how's all that going, first and foremost? Yep. When, when are you expecting delivery? And yep. are you finding that the design and delivery process, again, is, is informed really well by that global mm -hmm. team that can give you that input? Yep. Because there's not as many groups coming out of the ground as are, they are talking about building built to rent. No, you know, that's right. Which is, you know, just a function of time, I imagine. Yeah. But but it's also a function also of of capital willingness because of sure. the intensity of, of of you know the amount of capital required to do these projects is quite large, mm -hmm. and you know the 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 people who look after that money, say whether it's a pension or a sovereign or or a local Aussie super fund you know, they want to know that they're going to be allocating that capital to someone who they can trust. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, those two projects, South Yarra, South Melbourne, um, first one bought in 2019, second one bought in 2020. They will be starting on site this year. Uh, I would say South Melbourne will start somewhere around May, June. Um, we're talking Q3 for South, for, South, um, for South Yarra. That's all progressing well. We're through planning on South Yarra. We're still sort of in the system with, with South Melbourne, but it had an existing permit that we've just repurposed. So that's all going going along fine. I think we're on schedule for sort of 24, 25 delivery um, for, for those two for those two projects. And there'll be some staging with, with that as well. Julian, in terms of the landscape and growth of the built to rent sector, I'd be interested to get your gauge on what you're seeing are the demand drivers for your clients in terms of pursuing BTR projects. Um, oh, the drivers. Look, I think um, I think probably in. I mean, we we have offices in both Sydney and Melbourne. We have about 140, 150 in Sydney, and the same the same number in, in in Melbourne. I think probably in the last two years, you know, obviously the the sort of design pipeline's been a bit slow with the the pandemic. But I I think a lot of it actually is people recognise that that Melbourne remains one of the world's most attractive places to live, despite the fact that we've been through the world's longest lockdown. <laughs> Put that to one side it's for a moment. Memory, it's memory. a distant memory, I Josh. I think, and look, you know that Melbourne's, well, we, we, we hear that Melbourne's population is, is due to exceed Sydney's in 2027. Mm. You know, I think there's, there, there's probably, there will be a supply issue in, in Melbourne. Uh, and, and we know that 
with the slowdown in the build to sell market in at the end of 2018, nothing really took up the slack and we were lucky the build to rent came in. So Melbourne to me seems to be the most, at the moment, it's the most attractive place to be delivering large scale um, housing for people, people to live in, whether that's build to sell or, or build to rent. Which is such a stark contrast to what we're talking about in Australia. We, we seem to read a headline every day about build to rent, yet when you actually look at the size of the sector, we, we can count the players on two hands in Australia. First of all, Chris, why do you think it's such a big talking point in Australia? And I know we don't want to get political today, and you've told me specifically you don't want to get political <laughs> today. But do you think, do you think, broadly speaking, government support of the sector will be critical for its growth? And if it opens up further, do you think a lot more players come into the sector to make it bigger than the sort of niche sector that it is today? I mean, in terms of the why it's such a a, a prevalent topic in in the media, um, I think, is we talked earlier about you know the great Australian dream in home ownership and so on. Is you know there is a national obsession with housing. Yeah. Um, so reality is it's um, you know it's very easy to sort of bring that in and in um, you know into uh, you know the broader discussion around commercial real estate and and markets um, uh, as such. Reality is in the rest of the world. Um, be it whether it's the US, um, you know, continental Europe, you know, as you say, Julian, or you know, Japan's a huge market as well. The changes from a legislative standpoint yeah. um, have made things a lot easier in uh, in Victoria. Yeah. Um, New South Wales actually went first with their changes. Victoria came second. But Victoria in Melbourne in particular, it was already easier to make the economics of, of the transactions or, or the investments work. Because of land prices? Land or, prices yeah. is probably the, the main thing. Yeah. And then when you take land prices and then you overlay land tax and the impact that that has, mm. it just works better in Melbourne. The economics just work better. And you know those reform by both the New South Wales and the Victorian government as relates to the treatment of land tax for BTR has been critically important to the, um, you know, the, the further growth of the further growth of the sector. Julian, as I understand it, Bates Smart's working quite closely with Grocon, who you mentioned earlier, Oxford Properties yeah. as well. Based on the projects that you've done design schemes for, is there a sweet spot that seems to work best for BTR? Yeah, I think so. I mean anything over um, you know, probably two hundred what 150, 200 apartments, the projects we're working on, the ones you mentioned are sort of upwards of three, four hundred the um, QVM Munro project we're doing with Mervax approaching 500 apartments. It allows them to get efficiency out of their management teams, the building itself, and, and you know, they can drive a, a sort of more cost-effective outcome. Um, there, there are consistencies across the briefs that we're getting. So for example, we're seeing that the amount of amenity space being delivered in these projects is typically sort of three and a half square metres of indoor amenity uh, per apartment. It will be interesting to see how this plays out here is that they're clipping your ticket there, you're paying for all of that additional amenity and you're paying $1,000 a year for access to the pool, you have a DJ that comes in on the weekend and you can bring your friends in for $150 a head. It's all of that sort of thing is happening, which is interesting and it's... I thought you said it was all free. Well, I didn't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got to ask this a few times along the journey. In an, in an Armageddon scenario that we're BTR for whatever reason just doesn't work anymore or there's you know, a tax change or whatever it is that makes it difficult. Uh, the, from a design perspective, could an apartment building turn into a build to sell building? Well, could you still good. strata title and sell down the units it's if a, you absolutely had to? It's a good, good question, question and that's being, that's being tested at the moment. If you look at the projects that are, that are coming through, there's an ever increasing um, delivery of studio apartments. Right. That just didn't happen in a build to sell environment because you know, no one's lending lending to people who want to buy a studio apartment. So we, we had... So Julian, from a planning perspective, do you think that councils and governments are doing enough to encourage the sector? Look, sometimes the planning departments do move very slowly and they would, you know, at times they have, they have good reason for that. But the build to rent market, you would argue, is coming on more quickly than the planning department's able to, to cope with it, particularly after the sort of lean period of build to sell I think they're catching up, but I see I see that the an issue arising between the build to rent operators coming in with very sophisticated understanding of how people want to live and being focused on delivering that product. 
I don't think at the moment that the apartment design standards that were published in, in um, Victoria a few years ago are brilliant in that they've improved the level of, of quality and raised the, raised the bar, um, certainly in terms of development and the quality of apartments that people are, are, are getting into. But I think um, there needs to be modification to account for the fact that there is so much of this build to rent product coming in and there are, there are nuances in the build to rent product that will always be there and it does move very quickly and there's a huge amount of learning from the rest of the world that will come into Australia very quickly, frankly, after this first wave of projects are delivered. So, Do so you think they're using the wrong lens at times to look at you know, oh, look, I think I, I think they'll just I think they'll learn like yeah. all of us, you know, I think they'll learn that they need to be very nimble and, and need to need to. I mean, for example, New South Wales have int introduced controls to their um, SEP 65, which which acknowledge build to rent right. as a sector right. and provide a greater degree of flexibility that has not come into Victoria. It needs to come in. And look, I think it will. I think it will. It's just got to be done quickly to are you, support are you build finding to that frustration yeah, with the planning? I, I think that what, what I'd add to the, the New South Wales point that, that you make is I actually think Victoria started from, yes, um, yeah, apartment design standards yeah. certainly improved what was there before. The standard that that got to was nowhere near as onerous as what you see um, in mm. New South Wales. New South Wales is much more onerous from mm. a planning standpoint. Mm. Look, you know, if you look at our South Yarra project, you know, there's probably some things there which um, people might not have thought, um, you know, or, or would have thought would probably be quite difficult to to get through council and get through planning. And we did have to go on an education. Um, we had to take them on the journey, um, the Stonington Council. What, what for but example, they, like height or bulk or? No, no, the, the apartments room. themselves. Yeah, yeah okay. the apartments themselves yeah. um, and their compliance with um, with the apartment design standards. Yeah. And, uh, and, and just to, I guess, educate them on the, um, the style of offering and what, what was actually available to residents, not only within their apartments, again, going back to that point of what's outside their apartment, what can they enjoy and the level of amenity space that's there and how does that then influence what the size of their apartment really needs to be mm. and what the amenity of that apartment really needs to look like. But they were actually, you know, open-minded and I think we got a great outcome in terms of our planning there, but it was a journey that we had to go on, on with them. Um, but, you know, thankfully they were um, willing to go on that journey and, you know, worked with us and we obviously provided a lot of collateral to help them understand. It was a journey for us to go on and, and you yeah, know, thankfully got the right outcome. And from all accounts, that outcome's been really positive yeah, and, sure. and should really re reignite that little uh, Forest Hill precinct within South Yarra. I think it's, you're connecting from Claremont all the way through to Yarra Street, is that right? Yep. And you'll be yep. able to walk through. Yeah, we're cutting a laneway on the southern boundary. Um, right. We'll activate that with some with some retail and some other uses along there. So yeah, look, it'll create another connection, which, which was actually the original you know, vision for the precinct was yeah. a series of laneways that ran down connecting Claremont and, and Yarra, and this was the missing piece, but it had different owners, so they could never cut through mm -hmm. kind of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, look, hopefully it is um, a bit of a, a changer for for the precinct, um, time will tell, but um, you know, we're pretty pleased with the outcome we got there. Yeah, good on you. Just one final question for each of you, starting with yourself, Josh. You've sold quite a number of sites to build to rent players in the past 12 months. What, what impact has that had on values and what impact do you think it'll have in the next 12 months? There's been a lot of change in the space. Um, you know, we've been selling development sites for nigh on a decade now and, and the, the shift in um, the tastes and demands of developers has definitely been apparent, particularly over the last four or five years. Um, from, from a build to rent perspective, it's a very strict criteria around where it is and what it is and the sort of scale that you can achieve there and what the demographic drivers are going to be and what's going to drive that rental growth into the future. And a lot of that is sometimes not something we can sell as agents. It's more up to the, the purchaser to make their own decision around what the future is going to hold for that area. But by and large, if it's an inner city site, um, that is capable of, of accommodating 150 to 200 units plus, uh, depending on the model of the developer. Um, we're finding there's a, a real increase in interest from build to rent players that are looking to get more exposure into the sector, build up a portfolio or a critical mass of apartments. That competition isn't, isn't necessarily pushing prices to what people like to think are record levels. I think it's just a reignition of interest in a space which was really starting to fall away from the traditional build to sell developers so mm. um, yes it's you know it can be quite aggressive but they're all built they're all working off a pretty strict feasibility and it's, it's a total return feasibility where you know if the settlement's shorter the price is is lower if the if the settlement's longer the price can be more attractive but there's not a lot of 
movement in the way that these these calculations are put together. And sometimes that can be beneficial for the landowner who's selling, but other times it, it's it's by and large in the same pack as all the other developers. So it is it is site specific, but you know some recent transactions we've handled. You know, there's there's a good um, majority of the the bidders that are coming from the build to rent sector, whereas two years ago, mm. it might have been one or two that were just sniffing around just to see what the market was doing. And, and Chris was definitely one of those in the early days. And now he's been joined by quite a few in his cohort that are keen to acquire, to, to commit the funds and, and then deliver those projects. And Julian, in terms of your Ford workbook of orders, what percentage would you say are build to rent projects? And then do you expect that to grow over the next 12 months? Oh, I think so. I'm, I'm sure it will grow. Um, we, I would say probably 50, 60 percent of our residential work is uh, built to rent at the moment. Um, and I think as, as these projects get delivered, you know, as I said, City Road project with, um, with Home will be finished in the next month. Um, QVM Munro with Mervac will be finished at the end of the year. I think people will start to gather the data and, and look at these projects and see that they're real and that their occupancy rates are, you know, getting up to the levels they need to be. And I, I, I think we'll see a lot more of these. And then I think what we'll see is some of the, the, the people who are some of the, the large scale Australian um, developers and super funds who are sitting back waiting for the first wave to come through, they'll, they'll get into the market in a big way. And so I think it's, it's coming to Australia. Population growth is, is something Australia needs to grapple with and we need to continue to deliver product and places for people to live and this this is you know this is one key component of that. As I understand it, Greystar raised around about 1.3 billion in funds last year to support your build to rent projects in Australia. What what percentage of that has been allocated and, and what's left to deploy over the next six or twelve months? Yes. Well we're about um, a third of the way through so far. Um, and you know, the hope is that, um, you know, or the aim um, certainly is that by the by the end of the year, um, you know, we should be um, have the majority of that capital allocated before the end of the year. So, you know, there's a good uh, there's a good number of projects sort of on the slate um, at the moment that we've got in various stages of due diligence. But you know, we we expect this to be a pretty active year, um, and hopefully, you know, Josh can dig a couple of extras out of his uh, out of his back. I've got a few brochures. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Key of Greystar. Julian Anderson of Bait Smart, my fellow moderator Josh Rutman. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon, guys. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into the roundtable, and we look forward to welcoming you to the next episode. <laughs>